today I'd like to talk to you about nanotechnology, a little bit about what it is, where it came from, and then a vision about where it's going to go. So the nano, National Nanotechnology Initiative was developed in 2000, launched by the U.S. government, and it's a way of funding research in this area. And you can see the definition here of nanotechnology. What's really important here is not so much the, the wide array of uh, phenomena that come out of this area, but really it's focused on the size scale we're talking about, the nano scale. Potential applications cover just about every area of human endeavor that involve materials, things you can touch. And this is in the process of revolutionizing society in many different ways. And you can see the list here. Medicine, uh, industrial manufacturing, space exploration perhaps, all of these things are going to be impacted and are being impacted by nanotechnology. So what is nano? If we start out with the macro world that we're used to where we see things, the small end of that is an ant, say. And if we go a thousand times smaller than an ant, we get down to a red blood cell, perhaps. And that's the micro world. Things that are too small to see with the naked eye, things that are way too small to manipulate with our fingers, um, that, that's the micro regime. But that's way bigger than the nano scale. We need to go another factor of a hundred smaller than that to get into nano. Okay, and the nano world involves objects that are uh, far smaller than, than, than the blood vessel, or the blood uh, cell. And actually the biological machinery inside the cell is what we're talking about, large proteins, for example. Now this is, of course, extremely tiny, ex unless you're a chemist. For a chemist like myself, the nanoscale is very large because we're used to dealing with small molecules that are a fraction of a nanometer up to maybe a couple of nanometers. And so to think about nanotechnology, for us, that's assembling large numbers of small molecules. So nanotechnology, the, the sort of the vision, probably came out of some lectures given by uh, Richard Feynman, a, quite a famous physicist, around 1960. And he gave a lecture called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Most of that lecture was focused on the ability to pack more information into smaller space. And of course, in the half century or so since that time, this has, of course, led to the development of our computer technology, of our iPhones, and so forth. But he also speculated on some other things, some nanorobots. He talked about swallowing the doctor, little, little uh, machines that you could eat by the millions, and they would flow around in your blood vessels and, and perhaps clean out the plaque from your arteries from eating too many hamburgers. Uh, and, and had a vision of how this might be done and also some cautions about how difficult it might be. Now, stepping forward in time, uh, this guy probably popularized the idea of nanotechnology and maybe even invented the word nanotechnology, Eric Drexler. And Drexler has uh, written a few books. He popularized the idea. He's also provided uh, some schematics. He doesn't do wet chemistry himself or wet science but he uh, made some schematics on how pumps or gears or other types of mechanical devices might be scaled way down so that, for example, in this picture you see individual atoms placed strategically to, to generate a gear. So he talked about how this might be done. He talked a little bit about the social implications of this, and he also talked about the dark side, and I don't think he's too worried about flesh-eating nanorobots, but uh, there are potentially some downsides in misuse of technology. Now, the, this idea is, these ideas have been uh, taken up by, by society in many different ways, and also by the governments. That's what led to the funding of the National uh, Nano Science Institute, uh, Institute, and also uh, in some of the professional journals. And so, this, uh, this appeared in a uh, dental journal, uh, the, this idea of a nanoprobe. And th th this isn't the, the swallow a doctor, it's gargle a dentist, I think. And so the, the idea would be that this, you, you'd take a little mouthwash and this, these little nanorobots would go around and they'd uh, clean the plaque off your teeth and maybe repair some fissures in your teeth. And you, you see that this thing looks a lot like a NASA space probe. It's got hydraulics and external sensors on board computers. I don't know what the power source is. I'm hoping it's not a nano rea nuclear reactor. But uh, the, the question is not whether this kind of thing is ever going to be possible. Uh, it may violate some of the laws of chemistry and physics, but whether we should be using this sort of a strategy as a design. And I would suggest we don't want to do that. This 
follows sort of the, some of the problems that we have in material sciences that we tend to over-engineer things. We make them far more robust than they need to be. For example, the plastic bag that you get from the grocery store. That has a functional lifetime of maybe 30 minutes while you carry your grocery home, but the thing will persist in the environment for decades. That's not really the way we want to do it in a sustainable world. What we really need to do in our design strategy is to go with biomimicry. We need to turn to biology, which actually is where some of the most uh, intriguing bio or nano machines already exist. Okay, let's use that as a model. And this is what I mean. Let me give you some examples from my research group. This is a schematic of a liposome. A liposome is like a cell wall that you saw in the previous slide, made up of lipids. Lipids have a polar head group, something that likes water, and a greasy tail that doesn't like water. And when you put those into water, they will self-assemble into this sphere. The spheres that we use are about 100 nanometers in diameter and about 6 nanometers uh, in width of the wall. Okay? And I would suggest to you that this is the platform for a nano machine. Okay? It doesn't look like a lip machine, but in fact it will have many of the same characteristics of the, the machine that you saw earlier, the mechanical thing that you might uh, think about when you talk machines. But it has some features that are more important, like it will biodegrade just like any other biological system. Okay? So here's what we can do with it. We can put stuff in the middle. We can put drugs in the middle and we'll use this as a nano carrier to, to deliver drugs to a tumor cell, for example. We can put imaging agents to help uh, contrast in MRIs. We can put perhaps magnets in there and move these things around with an external magnetic field. Now we can also uh, change the outside of this, change the exterior. Okay, and this, this is where we put a sugar on there, an antibody, a little bit of DNA maybe, a, uh, and we can direct where this thing goes and how it interacts with its environment. In our particular case, what we like to do is to put uh, something that's not found in nature, make a polymer string around the liposome. This gives it color. When we first make them, the things are blue. Uh, but when they encounter a stress, they turn from blue to red. Okay? And that stress can be many different things depending on the decoration on the outside. In our particular case, we're interested in decorating it so that they interact with bacteria, specifically bacteria that cause foodborne illnesses, E. coli and so forth. And so you see from the slide here, the uh, original blue color changes to red depending on what sort of bacteria is present. We're working with uh, food companies in, in food processing plants to help to minimize the risk of foodborne diseases coming out of, of those facilities. All right, so I want to finish up by uh, talking about uh, a, a hero of mine, uh, Roald Hoffman. He's not only a Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry, but also a philosopher, a poet, and a playwright. And this is his take on nanotechnology, and I think you can see that he describes some of the features we've been talking about, the precision engineering, and, and he gets a sense of the beauty behind the thing. But his, his final line, which I think is a take-home message here, is that nanotechnology should be inherently benign by design. That's where the future lies of nanotechnology. Thank you. Thank you.